third point you might make in responding to this question is that a good outline can introduce the reader to an interesting character by means of comparisons which describe their appearance or describe dominant characteristics which they have, or by introducing a dramatic dialogue between two characters who are in conflict with one another. So if we try to apply this to the opening chapter of The Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, we can see in chapter one that the, the setting is introduced through Harper Lee's clever use of personification, she creates an oppressive mood and a sultry atmosphere. We're introduced to a surreal kind of place where the veneer of civilization hangs like a canopy over nature. Lots of similes are used by Harper Lee in chapter one of The Kill a Mockingbird. And really I was left with a sense that this was not a wonderful place for a child to grow up. From the very first line, we can see that this is a first person narrative. And it begins with a dramatic incident which arouses our curiosity as a reader. So we're left asking these questions. Who are the Yules and the mysteriously named Boo Radley? Where did he come out from? So the opening of The Kill a Mockingbird begins by telling us, when he was nearly 13, my brother Jen got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jen's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. I maintained that the Yules had started at all, but Jen, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The setting is then described in the opening pages, and it's described in very atmospheric terms. And you're met with the sense that it's, it's not really a place I'd like to grow up. Is it a place you'd like to grow up? I don't think so. Macon was an old town, but it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red stop. Grass grew on the sidewalks, the courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts, flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks in the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon after their three o'clock naps, and by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. So that's a good example of the main points that you'd focus on if you're writing about the opening of, of The Kill a Mockingbird and responding to questions on the exam paper. One of the questions that came up in the sample paper followed by the department asked, using the criteria you suggested in A and B above, write an assessment of the opening and closing sections of any novel you've studied as part of your course. So obviously, we've chosen to talk about The Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. You might respond to this question by saying something like, the opening chapter of Kill a Mockingbird is brilliant because it arouses our curiosity, introduces an interesting setting, and creates a vivid sense picture of the world which the Finch children have to grow up in. So what that is a good example of is a response statement. You respond to the wording of the question given, and you clearly state the three main points that you're going to make in your answer. So that gives you the topic sentences that you're going to use in each subsequent paragraph in responding to this question. From the very first paragraph, Harper Lee grabbed my attention by having the first person narrator, Jean Louise Gout Finch, introduce an interesting fact that her older brother Jem had broken his arm. However, she did not provide enough details about the incident to make me feel satisfied with the report provided in the opening paragraph. She told me that she believed the Ewell started, but I wanted to know who the Ewells were, what it was they had started, and how did Jem break his arm? So in that paragraph, I've given a good personal response to the question that's been delivered. The first descriptions of Macon really grabbed my attention because Harper Lee used comparisons and sound effects to appeal to my tactile sense, my sense of feeling. And I felt thirsty after hearing how hot and sticky the summer was in Alabama. There was an oppressive mood and a sultry atmosphere evident in the descriptions of the people. The use of similes and metaphors gave me the impression that this would be a very boring place for a child to grow up because everything happened like clockwork. Now in this second paragraph, I've clearly given a personal response showing you know, that I've used my skills as a reader to work out what kind of a place this was for the character to grow up. But I've also shown that I've related to the character's experience. But what's made this a good, a good answer is the fact that I've also referred to the way that the character style contributed to my experience as a reader. 
by clearly stating the poetic, rather stylistic devices and descriptive language that you use. Including quotations can be useful in illustrating the points that you're making. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon, after their three o'clock naps, and by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frost since of sweat and sweet talcum. Scout's tone of voice and her use of personification create the impression that she's very familiar with her hometown, perhaps too familiar, maybe even fed up with living there. Macon was an old town, but it was a tired old town when first I knew it. The use of onomatopoeia and alliteration made me feel like I was walking through the overground streets with her. It was not my most pleasant experience, but it really helped me to feel sympathy for the young, young narrator. The streets turned to red slop, grass grew on the sidewalks, the courthouse sagged in the square. As strange as it may seem, despite feeling her pain of boredom, I really felt that this was a great opening to the novel. Now that's about as good a response as you can give. The second topic that's going to be really relevant to any novel that you've studied is understanding the relationships between the characters. And if you're clever, you can use the same key scenes or key moments from the novel to illustrate a key relationship and also show the development of the main character. You might also use the same key moments to write about the main themes that are examined in the novel. So when we look at relationships, if you were asked, for example, to list three reasons why it's important for authors to develop interesting relationships in their narratives, you might say that relationships between characters can help readers to see their dominant characteristics in action. So it helps us to understand characterization. Relationships can chronicle the development of characters and illustrate how they are changed by formative events which occur in the story. They can emphasize the lessons which characters learn as they might outgrow the influence of a particular character, for instance. Our relationships, you could say, are a good vehicle to show plot developments and often add conflict and drama to stories. Now, when we look at To Kill a Mockingbird, Scout is very much a daddy's girl. She may not want to be, but she can't help herself. Throughout the novel, Atticus treats his children as equals as he attempts to transmit the democratic values which motive him as, motivate him as a character. Um, and this relationship between father and daughter, is central to Scout's development as a character, because her father is not a typical father for the 1930s in a southern state of America. He's very much an open-minded man, a man of integrity, a man who treats his children as intellectual equals and tries to convey his deep-held moral values. So if you're to focus on key moments which clearly illustrate this relationship between father and daughter, Atticus and Scout growing, you might talk about chapter three because a lot of the time in this novel, Atticus is, is deliberately trying to convey a moral message about the importance of having empathy and respect and respecting the dignity of other people. He's very much a Democrat. First of all, he said in chapter three, if you can learn a simple trick sketch, you'll get along a lot better with all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, sir, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. In chapter seven, we can see how these words from Atticus have really hit the mark with Scout and how they've influenced her development as a character. As Atticus once advised me to do, I tried to climb into Jem's skin and walk around in it. If I had gone alone to the Radley place at two in the morning, my funeral would have been held the next afternoon. So I left Jen alone and tried not to bother. In chapter 15, we have this very interesting moment when Scout actually intervenes to save her father from the lynch mob outside the prison. What's the matter, I asked. Atticus said nothing. I looked up at Mr. Cunningham, whose face was equally impassive. Then he did a peculiar thing. He squatted down and took me by both shoulders. I'll tell you, say, hey, little lady, he said. Then he straightened up and waved a big ball. Let's clear out, he's called. Let's get going, boys. So this is an example where, where Scout actually protects her father unwittingly. And her childlike innocence uh, serves to, to protect her father from these gathering forces of malevolence in the world. 